Part 7 of Acres of Diamonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Acres of Diamonds by Russell H. Conwell. Part 7. 4. His Power as Orator and Preacher. Even as a young man, Conwell won local fame as an orator. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he began making patriotic speeches that gained enlistments. After going to the front, he was sent back home for a time on furlough to make more speeches and draw more recruits. For his speeches were so persuasive, so powerful, so full of homely and patriotic feeling that the men who heard them thronged into the ranks. And as a preacher, he uses persuasion power, simple and homely eloquence, to draw men to the ranks of Christianity. He is an orator born, and he has developed this inborn power by the hardest of study and thought and practice. He is one of those rare men who always sees and hold the attention. When he speaks, men listen. It is quality temperament control. The word is immaterial, but the fact is very material indeed. Some quarter of a century ago, Conwell published a little book for students on the study and practice of oratory. That clear-cut articulation is the charm of eloquence is one of his insisted upon statements and it well illustrates his lifelong practice of the man himself for every word as he talks can be heard in every part of a large building yet he always speaks without apparent effort he avoids elocution his voice is soft pit and never breaks even now when he is over seventy because as he explains it he always speaks in his natural voice there is never a straining after effect. A speaker must possess a large-hearted regard for the welfare of his audience, he writes, and here again we see Conwell explaining Conwellism. Enthusiasm invites enthusiasm is another of his points of importance, and one understands that it is by deliberate purpose and not by chance that he tries with such tremendous effort to put enthusiasm into the hearers with every sermon and every lecture that he delivers. It is easy to raise a laugh, but dangerous, for it is the greatest test of an orator's control of his audience to be able to land them again on solid earth of sober thinking. I have known him, at the very end of a sermon, to have a ripple of laughter sweep over the entire congregation, and then in a moment he has every individual under his control listening soberly to his words. He never fears to use humor, and it is always very simple and obvious and effective. With him, even a very simple pun may be used, not only without taking away from the strength of what he is saying, but with a vivid increase of impressiveness. And when he says something funny, it is such an, a delightful and confidential way, with such a genial, quiet, affectious humorousness that his audience is captivated and they never think that he is telling something funny of his own. It seems, such is the skill of the man, that he is just letting them know of something humorous, that they can enjoy it with him. Be absolutely truthful and scrupulously clear, he writes, and with delightful, terse common sense, he says, use illustrations that illustrate. And never did an orator live up to this injunction more than does Conwell himself. Nothing is more surprising, nothing is more interesting, than the way in which he makes use of illustrations of the impressions and incidences of his long and varied life. And whatever it is, it has direct and instant bearing upon the progress of his discourse. He will refer to something that he heard a child say in a train yesterday. In a few minutes he will speak of something that he saw or someone whom he met last month or last year or ten years ago in Ohio, in California, in London, in Paris, in New York, in Bombay. In each memory, each illustration, is a hammer with which he drives home a truth. The vast number of places he has visited and people he has met, the infinite variety of things his observant eyes have seen, give him his ceaseless flow of illustrations. And his memory and his skill make admirable use of them. It is seldom that he uses an illustration from what he has read. Everything is characteristically his own. Henry M. Stanley, who knew him well, referred to him as that double-sided Yankee who could see at a glance all that there is and all there ever was. And never was there a man who supplements with personal reminiscence the place or the person 
that has figured in the illustration. When he illustrates with the story of the discovery of California gold at Sutter's, he almost parenthetically remarks, I delivered this lecture on that very spot a few years ago, that is, in the town that arose on that very spot. And when he illustrates by the story of the invention of the sewing machine, he adds, I suppose that if any of you were asked who was the inventor of the sewing machine, you would say that it is Elias Howe. But that would be a mistake. I was with Elias Howe in the Civil War, and he often used to tell me how he had tried for 14 years to invent the sewing machine, and then his wife, feeling that something really had to be done, invented it in a couple hours. Listening to him, you begin to feel in touch with everybody and everything, and in a friendly and intimate way. Always, whether in the pulpit or on the platform, as in private conversation, there is an absolute simplicity about the man and his words, a simplicity and earnestness, a complete honesty. And when he sits down in his book on oratory, no man has the right to use words carelessly. He stands for that respect for word craftsmanship that every successful speaker or writer must feel. Be intensely in earnest, he writes. And in writing this, he sets down a prime principle not only of his oratory, but of his life. A young minister told me that Dr. Conwell once said to him with deep feeling, always remember as you preach that you are striving to save at least one soul with every sermon. And to one of his close friends, Dr. Conwell said in one of his self-revealing conversations, I feel whenever I preach that there is always one person in the congregation to whom, in all probability, I shall never preach again, and therefore I feel that I must exert my utmost power in that last chance. And in this, even if this were all, one sees why each sermon is so impressive, and why his energy never lags, always with him, is the feeling that he is in this world to do all the good he possibly can do. Not a moment, not an opportunity must be lost. The moment he rises and steps in front of his pulpit, he has the attention of everyone in the building, and this attention he closely holds till he is through. Yet it is never by a striking effort that attention is gained, except in so far that his utter simplicity is striking. I want to preach so simply that you will not think of it as preaching, but you will think of it as listening to a friend. I remember him saying one Sunday morning as he began his sermon, and then he went on just as such homely, kindly, friendly words promised, and how efficiently. He believes that everything should be put as to be understood by all, and this belief applies not only to his preaching, but to the reading of the Bible, whose description he not only visualizes to himself, but makes vividly clear to his hearers and often makes fascination in result. For example, he is reading the tenth chapter of First Samuel. He begins, Thou shalt meet the company of prophets. Singers, it should be translated. He puts in, lifting his eyes from the page and looking out over his people. Then he goes on, taking this change as a matter of course. Thou shalt meet a company of singers coming down from the high place. Whereupon he again interrupts himself, and in irresistible explanatory aside which instantly raises the desired picture in the mind of everyone he says that means from the little old church on the hill you know and how plain and clear and real and interesting most of all interesting it is from this moment another man would have left it at the prophets coming down from the high place which would not have seemed at all alive or natural and here suddenly conwell has flashed his picture of the singers coming down from the little old church on the hill. There is a magic in doing that sort of thing. And he goes on reading, Thou shalt meet a company of singers coming down from that little old church on the hill, with a psaltery and a tibret and a pipe and a harp, and they shall sing. Music is one of Conwell's strongest aids. He sings himself, he sings as if he likes to sing, and often finds himself leading the singing, usually so indeed at the prayer meetings and often in effect at the church services. I remember at one church service that the choir leader was standing in front of the massed choir, ostensibly leading the singing, but Conwell himself standing at the rear of the pulpit platform with his eyes on the hymn book, silently swaying a little from the music and unconsciously beating time as he swayed, was just as unconsciously the real leader, for it was he whom the congregation was watching 
and with them they were keeping time. He never suspected it. He was merely thinking along with the music, and there was such a look of contagious happiness on his face as everyone as he made everyone in the building similarly happy. For he possesses a mysterious faculty in imbuing others with his own happiness. Not only singers, but the modern equivalent of psaltery and tibret and cymbals all have their place in Dr. Conwell's scheme of a church service. For there may be a piano, and there may even be a trombone, and there is a giant organ to help the voices. And at times, there are chiming bells. His musical taste seems to tend toward the thunderous. Or perhaps that is how he knows that there are times when people like to hear thunderous and are moved by it, and how the choir themselves like it. They occupy a great curving space behind the pulpit and put their hearts into song, and as the congregation disperses and the choir filters down, sometimes they are still singing, and some of them continue to sing as they go slowly out toward the doors. They are happy. Conwell himself is happy. All the congregation is happy. He makes everybody feel happy in coming to church. He makes the church attractive just as Howells was so long ago told that he did in Lexington. And there is something more than happiness. There is a sense of ease, of comfort, of general joy that is quite unmistakable. There is nothing of stiffness or constraint. And with it all, there is full reverence. It is no wonder that he is accustomed to fill every seat of that great building. His gestures are usually very simple. Now and then, when he works up to an emphasis, he strikes one fist in the palm of the other hand. When he is through, you do not remember that he has made any gestures at all, but the sound of his voice remains with you, and the look of his wonderful eyes. And though he has passed the threescore years and ten, he looks out over his people with eyes that still have the varied look of youth. Like all great men, he not only does big things, but keeps in touch with myriad details. When his assistant, announcing the funeral of an old member, hesitates about the street and number, and says that they can be found in the telephone directory, Dr. Conwell's voice breaks quietly in with such a number, giving it Dauphin Street, quietly and in a low tone, yet everyone in the church hears distinctively every syllable of that low voice. His fund of personal anecdote or personal reminiscence is constant and illustrative of his preaching, just as it is when he lectures, and the reminiscences sweep through many years and at times are really startling in the vivid and homelike pictures they present of the famous folk of the past that he knew. One Sunday evening, he made an almost casual reference to the one time he first met Garfield, then a candidate for the presidency. I asked Major McKinley, who I had met in Washington and whose home was in northern Ohio, as was that of Mr. Garfield, to go with me to Mr. Garfield's home and introduce me. When we got there, a neighbor had to find him. Jim Jim, he called. You see, Garfield was just plain old Jim to his neighbors. It's hard to recognize a hero over your back fence. He paused a moment for the appreciative ripple to subside and went on. We three talked together. What a rare talking it must have been. McKinley, Garfield, and Conwell. We talked together and after a while we got to the subject of hymns and those two great men both told me of how deeply they loved the old hymn the old-time religion garfield especially loved it so he told us because the good old man who brought him up as a boy and to whom he owed such gratitude used to sing it at the pasture bars outside of the boy's window every morning and young jim knew whenever he heard that old tune that it meant it was time for him to get up he said that he had heard the best concerts and the finest operas in the world, but had never heard anything he loved as he still loved the old-time religion. I forgot what a reason there was for McKinley's especially liking it, but he, as Garfield, liked it immensely. What followed was a striking example of Conwell's intentness on losing no chance to fix an impression in the hearer's mind. And at the same time, it was really an astounding proof of his power to move and sway, for a new expression came over his face, and he said, as if the idea had only at that moment occurred to him, as it most probably had, I think it's in our hymnal. 
And in a moment he announced the number, and the great organ struck, and every person in the great church, every man, woman, and child, joined in the swinging rhythm of verse after verse, as they could never tire of the old-time religion. It is a simple melody, more than a single line of almost monotone music. It was good enough for mother, and it's good enough for me. It was good enough on the fiery furnace, and it's good enough for me. Thus it went on, with never wearying iteration, each time with a refrain, more and more rhythmic and swaying. The old-time religion, the old-time religion, the old-time religion, it's good enough for me. That it was good enough for the Hebrew children, that it was good enough for Paul and Silas, that it will help you when you're dying, and, and it will show you the way to heaven. All these and still other lines were sung with a sort of wailing softness, a curious monotone, a depth of earnestness. And the man who had worked this miracle of control by evoking out of the past his memory of a meeting with two of the vanished great ones of the earth stood before his people, leading them, singing with them, his eyes aglow with an inward light. His magic had suddenly set them upon the spirit of the old camp meeting days, the days of pioneering and hardship when religion meant so much to everybody, and even those who knew nothing of such things felt them, even if but vaguely. Every heart was moved and touched, and every old tune will sing in the memory of all who heard it and sung it as long as they live. End of part seven.